Dr. Gao here? Oh, hello. Yeah, hi, children. I'm here. Okay, great. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, maybe good morning, some uh, even in the uh, in the east. And uh, welcome to the uh, CPGS uh, webinar, edu uh, educational webinar series. Um, the the theme of this uh, webinar series, uh, geo AI driven spatial temporal process understanding and uh, forecasting. And so this uh, uh, spatial uh, webinar series uh, initiated by the uh, Dr. Manzhu Yi of, uh, at uh, Penn State University. And so we have uh, five um, uh, talks over the next uh, five weeks. And so if you're interested in following the update, uh, you can also scan a QR code. Uh, if you're using WeChat, you can scan a QR code to follow the update. Uh, we also post the videos on our YouTube and also uh, on other social media channels. So make sure that you follow and uh, the link will be the same for all the webinars for this five. Uh, so if you already uh, register for the first one, you will have the same link. So we'll be meeting at the same time, 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time uh, here. And uh, on behalf of the uh, CPGS Education Committee, I'd like to welcome to uh, welcome you to this webinar series. And before we get started, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Song Gao, uh, the chair of the uh, board of directors uh, of uh, CPGS, and uh, because um, the uh, president, CPGS president, uh, Dr. Lam Mook, uh, could not be here today, so I will ask um, Dr. Gao to say a few words about this uh, webinar series. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wu, and uh, also Dr. Manju uh, for organizing this uh, webinar series. And on behalf of Chinese professional in GIA science, I'd like to uh, welcome you all and also uh, to introduce our organization. So CPGS, you know, uh, this is the 31st uh, anniversary of our organization. So the core mission of CPGS is to promote the exchange of the ideas, knowledge, and then scientific development in GI science. And between especially um, Chinese professionals and then those abroad. And we also want to promote education of GI science at all levels and across the world. So the CBGS educational webinar series is um, you know, supplying and also serving this goals. And uh, I do, Want to uh, definitely uh, you know thank you all for your participation, especially the speakers. So they yeah, uh, I will let uh, our host to introduce our uh, first uh, speaker, Doctor Henry Luan, and I just want to have a also personal meeting with Professor Luan before. So I really enjoy uh, his knowledge and expertise. So without further ado, I think I will back the stage to the host. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gao, for the uh, introduction to CPGS. And so today we have our first speaker, uh, Dr. Ruan, uh, Hui Ruan from Oregon State, uh, oh, sorry, University of Oregon. And uh, Dr. Ruan is an assistant professor in uh, spatial data science and uh, spatial epidemiology in the Department of Geography, uh, University of Oregon. He received his PhD degree in planning from uh, University of Waterloo, Canada. MBS and uh, MS degrees uh, in GS from uh, Wuhan University. Total one applies and develops uh, spatial temporal statistical models to investigate how health uh, phenomenon vary over space, time, and race uh, ethnicity, and how social economic, demographic, physical, and uh, built environmental factors contribute uh, to these variations. His research program focuses on advancing basing probabilistic uh, inferences in geospatial data analysis and promoting the application of uh, spatial temporal analysis and GS in uh, public health. Dr. Wang's uh, research has been funded by different agencies, uh, including the inaugural uh, VIEW Fellowship uh, from AIDSVIEW.org uh, and also the uh, Data Science uh, Initiative uh, C grant from uh, University of Oregon, the zone uh, Templeton Foundation and uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research Grants. His uh, work has been published in uh, flagship uh, geography, spatial data science, and public health journals, including the annals of the AG, IJGS, uh, spatial and uh, spatial temporal epidemiology, and uh, annals of uh, epidemiology. 
He currently serves uh, on the editorial board of the journal Spatial and uh, Spatial Temporal Epidemiology. Without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Wan for his uh, presentation. I'm going to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you for a very nice introduction, Dr. Gao and Dr. Uh, Wu. Uh, okay, I'm going to uh, start my presentation. Do uh, you see my slides uh, well? Not yet. You need to share it again. Uh, okay. Yeah, I see it probably there's an override. Looks good? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm honored to be here to give a webinar on busy spatial temporal system modeling with uh, applications in censored and zero inflated data analysis at small area levels. Uh, so I'm currently a uh, professor in, at the University of Oregon in the Department of Geography. And for your information, uh, this talk focuses on uh, lattice or area level data analysis. So that is data recorded for an area, either regular, such as grids, or irregular, uh, such as sense tracks uh, defined by administrative boundaries. So for statistical modeling and point pattern analysis, uh, different modeling approaches will be needed beyond the methods uh, covered in this webinar. And for small area level, uh, small areas, that refers to, for example, sense tracks, sense block groups uh, in the US context, or like JDAO in the Chinese context. Uh, and in some specific contexts, uh, the small area could refer to uh, areas such as counties, uh, for example, in health, because those are meaningful areas that those interventions can be uh, like prioritized uh, for uh, to improve population health. So my talk today is divided into three uh, parts. First, uh, I will briefly introduce the principles of business physics. Uh, I, uh, I see this uh, is needed because uh, to my uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, compared with frequency statistical models, the Bayesian statistical models are, are like rep comparatively underused uh, in geography. Uh, after that, I will uh, introduce the Bayesian spatial temporal modeling with count data at the area level. Uh, and finally, I will provide two examples of small area level analysis uh, by analyzing sensor data and zero inflated data, uh, the two common uh, uh, issues that we probably have when we analyze data set as a small area level. Okay, so before we uh, dive into these specific topics, uh, let's have a look at a spatial data set, uh, a data set probably you have uh, 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 experience uh, with uh, before. For example, let's say we have YS, which are aggregated value over an uh, area unit S, and S belongs to D, that is uh, the study region boundaries divided into a uh, countable connection of spatial uh, units. So one example uh, in this slide is a number of lung cancers in counties of uh, Ohio in 1988. But of course, uh, instead of like putting the number of uh, lung cancers on the map, we can also map the spatial patterns of lung cancer uh, using, for example, quantile maps. But usually we want to do more. That is, we would like to uncover the underlying spatial processes that generate the data set using statistical models. Yeah, and this, uh, because this observed data set is only a realization of the online process. And when the data is recorded over multiple uh, time points, the spatial case is extended to the spatial temporal case by including uh, time dimension, so from Ys to Yst, uh, which are random aggregated value over an area unit S at time point T. So this additional time dimension gives us a dynamic view of uh, the phenomenon, not only for the entire study region, but also for uh, small areas that consist of the study region. Yeah, so one example is this, uh, is the, uh, on this slide is the red risk of lung cancer in the counties of uh, Ohio from 1984 to 1988. Uh, so similarly, we would like to uncover the underlying spatial temporal process 
that generates this data set. And in other words, we are interested in uncovering the data generating process. And usually this overall spatial temporal uh, data gener generating process is complicated, but it can be decomposed into the combination of three different components. First, the overall spatial pattern, uh, which can be used to answer this question, which areas constantly have high or low values regardless of time. And the second component is the overall temporal pattern that answers this question. How does the phenomenon uh, evolve over time for the entire study area? And uh, finally, the space-time interaction component. Uh, so uh, exploring this component allow us to answer questions such as, do any local areas trends significantly differ from the overall uh, patterns? Yeah. Because in reality, we would expect to observe some local departures from the overall spatial and uh, overall temporal patterns. Uh, this departure could be, uh, for example, because of the uh, emergence of localized risk factors. So an increase in disease risk is observed in affected areas while uh, the overall trend for the, for example, for the study, uh, entire study uh, area could remain stable or even decreasing. So an answers to these uh, different questions have important policy implications. Uh, using uh, the lung cancer in Ohio's uh, counties as example, uh, the findings could guide uh, first for which counties more diagnosis sites should be constantly provided. Or should the investment in lung cancer diagnosis in Ohio be increasing or decreasing? And finally, which counties within Ohio should be allocated with additional diagnosis sites in specific years? So, uh, and usually answering these questions involve the estimation of many unknown parameters, which could be much larger than the number of data observations. So it is challenging to implement such a complicated model using the classic frequencies approach while simultaneously addressing issues including spatial correlation, temporal correlation, and space-time interaction, uh, let alone where other issues are also present, for example, the zero inflation and uh, the data sensory issue that we are going to introduce in the following slides. But in contrast, the Bayesian approach is more flexible in modeling uh, the spatial temporal data sets with complicated uh, structures and in addressing these uh, issues I just mentioned. So this table shows the specification of a Bayesian spatial temporal model. Uh, and for information, every Bayesian model is hierarchical because we specify the model in different levels. And here is one example. Let's say we have a variable OIT observed at location I and time T. And uh, a level one will assign the likelihood function based on the data, which assumes the underlying process of a phenomenon. Uh, and we call this as a data model. So depending on the uh, feature of the data, different probability distributions can be specified uh, depending if the data is continuous or discrete. And the second level links the parameters from the likelihood in level one with random effects and covariates. So uh, th these parameters of interest uh, could be, for example, the probability uh, from a uh, balloon distribution or binomial distribution, or the like expected count from a Poisson distribution. And level three specifies the prior distributions to the unknown parameters. So this is where we introduce the prior information and addresses issues such as spatial correlations and spatial temporal in interactions by using spatial distributions. And level four is optional. Uh, we include this level if prior distributions on level three also have unknown parameters. And these, they are known as hyperparameters. So before we go to the details of the Bayesian spatial temporal system models, I would like to uh, briefly uh, introduce the principles of Bayesian inference, which is based on this uh, famous Bayes theorem. So let's say we have observed data y with likelihood function fy uh, conditional on theta. And theta is a, a parameter uh, that we are interested in estimating. And we have some prior information of the uh, parameter theta, f theta. 
So we would be able to derive the posterior uh, probability of theta conditional on the observed data y, f theta uh, conditional on y. Uh, so here, the prior uh, distribution reflects the previous knowledge about the model uh, parameters. So the uh, it can be from expert knowledge or results from other uh, uh, similar projects. Uh, but when this uh, prior knowledge is scarce or even not available, then we can specify vague or non-informative priors to these unknown parameters. And so in this case, the posterior inference on those unknown parameters will be mainly driven by the observed data. And since uh, the F theta condition on Y is a full posterior probability distribution rather than a point estimate, so it can be used to quantify the uncertainties about the parameters uh, we estimate. So in this case, the theta. So this is also the difference between the frequentist and the Bayesian approaches. And also one of my favorite features of the Bayesian approaches for the modeling. So in practice, uh, Bayesian models can be uh, implemented using either the posterior sampling approach, for example, the Markov chain Monte Carlo MCMC approaches, which we will uh, briefly introduce in the following slides or it can be implemented using the posterior approximation. Uh, for example, the integrated elastic Laplace appro approximation, INA. So uh, this INA approach is uh, more computationally efficient compared with the, those MCMC approaches because it approximates those non-Gaussian approaches using Gaussian uh, distributions. So only uh, work with Gaussian distributions. Uh, so, uh, but for a uh, time constraint, I wouldn't be able to cover both. Uh, instead, I will focus on the MC, MC approaches uh, for uh, implementing uh, Bayesian models. Okay, so here are the differences between the two schools of statistics, the frequentist and uh, the Bayesian. First, they are different in interpreting uh, probability. So with the frequentist framework, a probability must be objective. So this objective probability is the frequency of event occurrence in a very long series of uh, repetitions. However, from the perspective of Bayesian statisticians, it is impossible to get the probability of certain events from those long run uh, repeatable experiments, for example, in the, for those economic events. Uh, but we can quantify uh, how likely uh, like an event is to occur based on our previous experience and relevant knowledge. So in this case, a probability can be subjective. And this subjectivity can be updated when more useful information or knowledge are available. And this difference in the interpretation of uh, a probability leads to the different information used for statistical inference in these two schools of statistics. So compared to uh, the frequentist approach, Bayesian analysis uses not only the sampling data, but also the prior information for posterior uh, inference using the Bayesian rules in the previous slide. And the third difference between uh, frequentist and Bayesian stats uh, also lies in the way they interpret data and parameters. So in those classic frequentist statistics, data is assumed to be random and parameters are fixed. While in contrast, in Bayesian statistics, data are, uh, uh, random, uh, are fixed and parameters are random. And this randomness of the uh, parameters can be expressed with probability distributions. And due to the different interpretations in data and parameters, so the interval estimations are different for those two schools of statistics. For frequentist, we use the 95% confidence interval to quantify uh, the uncertainty of parameter estimations. But it should be noted that this 95% is not the probability that the true value of the uh, unknown parameters falls in this interval, but that 95% of confidence intervals from those repeated experiments cover the true value. So this interval either covers or not cover the true value. But in contrast, 
uh, in BZ66, uh, so uh, we use the probability distribution to express parameters. So the resulting uh, 95 credible interval is interval in which the true value has a 95% uh, probability of occurring. So in this sense, it is more convenient to use uh, Bayesian approaches to quantify uncertainty. And when performing Bayesian inference, uh, an important topic is uh, specifying the prior distributions because the prior di distribution represents the information that is available for the parameters of interest. So here, where, uh, for prior specification, we, there are two aspects we need to consider. First, the type of the distribution, which should be uh, representative of the nature of the unknown parameters. And the second is the uh, hyperparameters, which would make the prior distribution more informative or less informative. That's providing the level of information available for the parameters. So in early times, uh, especially before the uh, development of MCMC uh, algorithms, a common approach to perform Bayesian inference is choose a, a conjugate prior. So a prior is called as a conjugate prior uh, if uh, the posterior distribution uh, P theta depend on uh, the, the condition on Y is in the same distribution family of the prior distribution p theta. So in this case, this, uh, uh, is this prior is called a conjugate prior for the likelihood function p y conditional on theta. So uh, because we can directly derive uh, the parameters from uh, the, uh, for the posterior distributions of the parameters of interest, uh, so it is comput uh, computationally efficient. And uh, further, uh, one further benefit is that it makes it more transparent regarding how the data likelihood uh, function updates a prior distribution. Yeah. So one example here uh, on this slide is the Poisson gamma uh, uh, distribution. So gamma is uh, uh, like a conjugate prior for the Poisson distribution because the posterior distribution for uh, the parameter of interest rho in this slide is also follows a gamma distribution. A1 and, uh, and B1. And A1 and B1 are just a weighted average of the parameters from the likelihood and prior. Yeah. But one limitation of using the conjugate prior is that uh, uh, they have limited flexibility. Not all the likelihood functions have an associated conjugate prior. So in this case, we will rely on the long conjugate prior which will rely, uh, rely on uh, algorithms to implement uh, these models, for example, MCMC, okay, which we will introduce in the following slides. So after we decide the functional form of the prior distribution, either conjugate or non-conjugate, we, uh, we also need to uh, specify the parameters of the prior distribution. So again, so this should be informed by whatever knowledge is available about the parameters. So uh, I want to emphasize here is that this is a critical issue in Bayesian inference and a source of major criticism from the frequentist school. So that's why we need to do it uh, uh, to do this carefully. So the first opinion prior uh, is the so-called non-informative prior, which is a prior that expresses lack of information. Let's say if our observed data, uh, like we assume that our observed data follows a balloon distribution with parameter of interest pi. And because pi can only lies between uh, zero and one, then we can assume that this pi follows, uh, the prior for pi is a uniform prior between the range zero and uh, one. So in this case, we assign equal probability on all the values in the possible range. But one drawback of the flat prior is that it is not invariant for parameter uh, reparameterization. For example, if we exponentiate a pi, uh, then it is no longer flat, but with a higher uh, density on those small values, which you, you can see uh, 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 on the slide. So there are other like alternative priors that we developed to, to address this issue. Uh, for example, the Jeffries prior, but those priors, they have their own uh, uh, issues. Uh, 
if you're interested, you can uh, go to this uh, book, Bayesian Biostats, to see more details of these uh, priors. So given that uh, the drawbacks associated with non-informative prior, instead of building a non-informative prior on the entire support uh, of the uh, parameters. So in, in most cases, it is sufficient to assure uh, ignorance on a subset of the support of the parameters. Uh, in other words, we can use vague prior to uh, specify vague prior to those parameters. So, uh, and for your information, uh, vague priors are also known as weak or diffuse priors. So one example here is that we can specify a normal distribution with mean zero and a large variance, in this case, 100K to the regression coefficient in a regression model. And finally, in some scenarios, we can specify informative prior to those unknown parameters if those prior information is available. Again, so this could be the, uh, uh, the results from previous studies on the same topic or expert knowledge. But the informative prior should be carefully specified because using a strongly informative prior, the posterior distributions of those unknown parameters will be closer to the prior uh, than to the likelihood. So this is different from the scenario when those non-informative or vague priors are used, that the posterior distribution will be more closer to the data set. Okay, so, so far we've talked about the Bayes uh, theorem and prior specifications. Another important topic in Bayesian stats is Bayesian computing, uh, which focuses on estimating the posterior distributions of unknown parameters uh, in this model. And we have seen that if a conjugate prior exists, so uh, we can der directly derive the functional form for the uh, described uh, posterior distributions of those unknown parameters. So this is analytically uh, uh, convenient. However, again, this conjugacy does not hold in most practical cases. So when the conjugate prior does not exist and uh, the posterior distribution is not available in the closed form, so it's, in this case, we will need to use other methods, including computational methods to estimate the unknown parameters. And a uh, predominantly used approach in the literature is the MC, MC approach, the Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, uh, which draws uh, the samples from the joint uh, posterior distributions of those unknown parameters. So when we use the MC, MC methods, we construct the Markov chains and iteratively simulate the values of those unknown parameters within a Markov chain. And the property of a Markov chain is that the transition probability is dependent on its previous state only, such that the PXT or uh, uh, the state T uh, uh, conditional on X0 uh, until X uh, T minus one equals to the property of xt conditional on xt minus one. Yeah. And this Markov chain eventually converges to the target distribution, which is also known as the stationary distribution that we need, which uh, from which we can draw samples for posterior inferences. For example, to calculate the posterior mean, posterior median, posterior standard deviation, et cetera. And in practice, the different MCMC uh, approaches have been proposed for Bayesian uh, inference. Uh, and one of the uh, popular and uh, efficient algorithm is uh, the Gates sampling uh, algorithm. So for this sampling, we uh, fir the first step is to set initial values because uh, uh, like we will need to initialize those chains that we construct. So let's say at, uh, so that we can record that as state zero. And then step two will be for the following state from one to T, we repeat the following uh, steps. We set theta uh, equals to theta at state T minus one. So in this case, if uh, for state one, theta one, we uh, set, set it to equal to theta zero. And for J equals to one, two until N, so that's the number of parameters, unknown parameters in, the, uh, uh, in your analysis. We update theta j from f theta j dependent on uh, theta uh, 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 backslash uh, j and y. 
So uh, where the uh, theta slash a equals to theta one uh, until theta n at a uh, state t. And then we can set the uh, theta at state t to, to theta and saves the uh, saves it as a generated set of values at t minus one iteration of the algorithm. So in short, the new generated short, uh, values of a parameter theta one at state t minus one depends on other parameters, theta two, theta three, until theta n at the previous state t. And, uh, but uh, theta uh, two at state t minus one uh, is dependent on uh, theta one at state t minus uh, t, uh, 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 plus one and uh, theta three until theta n at the uh, previous state t because at the uh, theta one has been uh, updated to state uh, uh, t minus uh, t uh, plus one. So this is uh, the process of this, this uh, uh, Gibbs sampling. But of course, like in the literature, other like sampling uh, approaches have been developed to address specific issues. For example, like the, the reversible jump MCMC approach, slice sampler, uh, or the, the Hamilton Monte Carlo, uh, uh, et cetera. They have been developed in uh, other uh, algorithms or tools such as Stan and Nimble. Uh, and if you, you're interested, you can check those tools uh, or algorithms out. And one important topic in MCMC-based BAZ inference is the convergence assessment, which assesses whether the algorithm has reached its stationary distribution. So if the algorithm has converged, then the generated sample comes from the correct stationary distribution, which we desire. So in this case, uh, so in this sense, it is essential to monitor the convergence of the algorithm for producing results from the posterior distribution uh, of the parameters of interest. Uh, and those samples before the convergence are discarded as burn-ins. And in practice, we have different tools to assess the convergence of those MCMC chains. So uh, for example, we can uh, check it visually by referring to the graphs uh, of tra the trace graph, the history graph, uh, and the correlation plots, for example, here. So uh, for example, like on the top in the history plot, if we see that those multiple chains, they are mixed well, so we can assume that the convergence is ensured. But in addition to these uh, like uh, visual uh, checking approaches, we can also use other test statistics to uh, assess the convergence of those chains. For example, if, if we uh, construct a single chain, then we can use the uh, uh, weak statistic. And if we construct multiple chains, we can uh, refer to the BGR uh, statistic. If the value of this BGR statistic is close to zero uh, to one, then we can see that uh, the uh, chains have conver converged. So as a popular, uh, Computing method for Bayesian uh, uh, computing, uh, MCMC uh, method has its own advantages uh, and disadvantages. So the advantages is that they are highly flexible and adaptable for parameter estimations of complex models. So we can use them to fit models with a large number of parameters. And we can also use them to fit models with non-standard likelihood. So one example that uh, will also be covered in uh, be covered in this webinar is the zero inflated model. So that will be a, a picture model that have two uh, underlying processes. So in this case, it, it is not really available. Now we can, but we can use MCMC approaches uh, to fit those those non-standard distributions. And MCMC uh, methods are also uh, uh, flexible. Uh, to fit models, uh, fit the data set with complex structures, spatial, spatial temporal, et cetera. Again, uh, we will see uh, the, in the following slides. But the uh, MCMC approaches have their uh, like all uh, an obvious disadvantages. First, they are computationally expensive because we have to, uh, usually we have to deal with high dimension uh, distributions. Uh, and this leads to, usually leads to uh, the, a slow conversions of the models. Yeah, I used to like fit a model like that. It took uh, over two weeks to uh, for the uh, MCMC chains to converge. So that's why, like in these days, like those approximation 
uh, based approach have been used for Bayesian inference. Again, so I don't have time to cover these uh, the inner approach, uh, but I would encourage you to check these uh, these methods out, which are pretty useful for uh, fitting spatial and spatial temporal models. Uh, uh, and on the uh, bottom, uh, it is the website to the inner project, so you can also check it out. Okay, so so far I've introduced Bayesian modeling. Uh, next, I'd like to illustrate the details of uh, fitting spatial temporal models using count data at area levels as, as an example. Uh, so in this case, the discrete distributions should be used in the data model level one. Yeah, so one example is that we can use, uh, assume that the data follows a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda it. So this is a distribution that is particularly useful for modeling uh, the health phenomena, including uh, 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 cancer, HIV, etc. So let's say we have observed counts yit uh, in area i uh, at time t, uh, with uh, and uh, the, this yit is assumed to follow a Poisson distribution with name, uh, parameter lambda it, uh, and lambda it is the product of the expected counts uh, and the relative risk rrit. So this is the parameter of interest we are uh, uh, we want to estimate. Uh, and this, using the link, link function log, uh, we can further decompose these uh, or link these uh, relative risk IT to the intercept and the random effects. So actually, this is an approach uh, that uh, a, major, uh, a predominantly used approach in disease mapping. But if we want to also inc uh, want to investigate what covariates. Uh, contribute to those spatial temporal variations in the data set. We can include the covariates xit uh, uh, like, uh, and the corresponding regression coefficient in the model. Actually, these are called uh, are known as economical regression approaches. So here, alpha uh, is the average overall red risk in the study region, and si is area-specific random effects, which is also the overall uh, uh, spatial pattern. The gamma t is the overall temporal random effects. And uh, the uh, uh, which can have different uh, uh, forms. So, and for your information, so this model uh, does not include the space time interaction term. So, that's why uh, we call it as a space time separable model. So, we can uh, specify, uh, use different distributions to, uh, assign, to be assigned to these uh, uh, different random effects. For example, for the uh, spatial random effects, again, the overall uh, uh, spatial pattern, so we can assign uh, like a conditional or regressive distribution as a prior to these spatial random effects. So these spatial random effects uh, term accounts for the potential spatial clustering, uh, thus those localized information sharing. So, uh, and they are a type of mock random model, which is uh, uh, a random field that satisfies those uh, mock of property, uh, uh, property, uh, properties. And here, the, the core uh, distribution uh, or the random facts are specified by a set of univariate for conditional distributions. And for your information, so these car models are commonly used as spatial priors to impose spatial dependence structure on the random effects. So, and the idea is that we borrow strength locally. So the parameter estimation of an area is similar to that from this area's neighbors. Yeah. So examples that belong uh, uh, to this car model uh, include the intrinsic uh, model, I car model, the conventional model, which is also known as a BYM model, and then the rule model. So first, the, uh, the ICAR model. So this is the simplest car prior. So, and indicates the conditional expectation of SI uh, is equal to the mean of the random effects at area I's neighbors. While the conditional variance is inversely uh, proportional to the number of neighbors and I. So that means the more neighbors an area has, the more information in the data about the value of the of its random effects and the smaller variation in the random effects. 
But there are some uh, limitations associated with this uh, ICOM model. First, it can only represent strong spatial correlation structure. So it's not appropriate for a data set with a weak correlation. Second, the joint distribution of the random facts is uh, improper, uh, which means that this distribution does not integrate to one. So that's why this di distrib distribution can only be used as a prior, but not a likelihood a function to directly model the data. And usually uh, we would need to impose a sum to zero uh, constraint to remedy uh, this issue. And uh, another commonly used uh, a car model is a convolution model, again, the BYM model. So in addition to the ICAR model that accounts for spatial clustering, we also include a set of spatially unstructured random effect at area I, which accountable for the spatial uh, heterogeneity in the model. Yeah. So uh, the advantage of this uh, uh, model is that it captures both spatial clustering and spatial heterogeneity. Uh, but the disadvantage uh, is that for each area, only the uh, like the sum of the two parts is identifiable. So that's why like we, we also see some uh, variation of this BYM model. For example, the modified BYM uh, uh, model that uh, to address this identifiability uh, problem. And finally, the LaRue uh, model, which also uses uh, like uh, which uses a single set of random effects. Uh, so it can be used to represent a range of weak and strong spatial correlation structures. So you can see that actually if the rho, which is a spatial correlation parameter, if it equals to zero, so this uh, uh, model reduces to an IID distribution, like a white noise, uh, a normal distribution with, without any uh, spatial uh, clustering uh, uh, patterns. But when it, uh, rho equal, equals to one, so it represents an ICAR model. Yeah. So, uh, but of course, like in the literature, there are other spatial priors that we can use. For example, the proper car, which addresses the like impropriety associated with ICAR model by refining, uh, redefining the uh, precision matrix. We also have the locally adaptive spatial prior, which allows the spatial varying correlations such that those local uh, abrupt changes rather than the uh, local smoothing can be uh, modeled or accounted for in the model. Uh, but of course, like we, if we are modeling more than one outcome, that is more than one Y, then we can use the multivariate car model. Uh, again, so we don't have like time to detail these uh, prior uh, distributions or car uh, models, uh, variations of car models. So you, you encourage you to check this out if you are interested. So for the... Um, the overall temporal trend or the temp uh, temporal component, uh, like gamma t, we we have uh, different like options. First, first we can model uh, uh, t as a covariate. So in this case, gamma t will be a product of gamma, so the overall trend multiplied by the time t. Uh, but another commonly used approach is a random walk of different orders. For example, order one and order two. Order one as uh, uh, if we are using RW1, then the value at uh, state t is only dependent on the previous state. Uh, but if we are using RW2, then the value at t is dependent on the values at time points t minus one and t uh, minus two. And here, the sigma squared is usually estimated from the data with a vague or non-informative prior uh, assigned. But here, like in practice, those RW1 and RW2 uh, specification can also be formed in the undirected symmetric form. So the estimation of gamma t borrows information not only from the past time points, but also from the future time points. And some researchers have found that this bi-directional symmetric form is more efficient to share information over time. But of course, like we have other uh, like options for the temporal effects beyond these, uh, these options on the slide. For example, we have the B, uh, splines uh, or B, 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 splines B splines model to account for the nonlinearity of the uh, temporal trend in the model. So again, so, so far we talked about the space separate model. 
So while this uh, space-time separate model is a sensible starting point for analyzing the spatial temporal data, in a lot of cases, they probably would not uh, fit the data well, given its rather restrictive space-time separability. Uh, because this space-time separate model assumes that all areas have the same temporal trend, which is the overall time temporal trend as for the entire study region. And similarly, at the different time points, the spatial pattern is uh, the same. But again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, in reality, we would expect to observe some local departures from the overall spatial and overall temporal patterns. In other words, the space-time interactions. So in this case, we will need to move from space-time separate model to space-time inseparable model by adding a space-time interaction term. And we have different approaches to model these space-time inseparability. First, we can use the parametric model. So that is, again, the T is used as a covariate. But in addition to gamma, which applies to all the uh, entire, entire region, we also have a term delta T, uh, delta I. So that is a differential trend in area I, in addition to the overall temporal trend. So in this case, the area-specific trend identified will be the sum of gamma and the delta I. Uh, if the delta I is smaller than zero, then we can see that the area-specific trend is less steep than the global trend. And if delta I is greater than zero, then area-specific trend is steeper than the global trend. And of course, different priors can be specified to delta I. For example, we can use uh, like a normal distribution, IAD distribution, but we can also uh, like assign an I car model to uh, account for the, uh, the situation when the differential trend is spatially clustered. So in practice, so this parametric trend model is useful for a data set collected for two to five time points. And we can easily see which areas show a different trend during study period. But it becomes rather, rather restrictive when the data is connected from, for more than five time points. Uh, so in this case, uh, the linear trend is, uh, or a uh, nonlinear trend model probably will be needed. So the second approach to account for uh, the space-time inseparability is through non-parametric dynamic trend model. That is, we use different uh, random effects terms, gamma t and delta it respectively to represent the overall temporal trend and the space-time interaction in area i uh, at time point t. So you can see that at least uh, one plus n plus t plus n by t parameters must be estimated. Yeah. So again, it is challenging to, to do this uh, inference in using a frequency approach. Uh, but in Bayesian, we can borrow uh, 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 address this issue to uh, uh, by borrowing and imposing a dependent structure on the space-time uh, parameters. So here we have different uh, options for the uh, to model space-time interaction. Type one is that we assume all space-time parameters are exchangeable. So we can assign an ID model with mean zero and uh, a variance a sigma delta squared to uh, these delta IT parameters, space-time interaction term. Uh, type two uh, assumes that only temporal parameters in each area is most. Uh, so in this case, we can assign, for example, to use a random walk of order one assigned to uh, the, the parameter delta IT uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the model. And type, sorry, so this one. Type three, so we, uh, uh, is similar to the type two, but in this case, we assume that only area specific parameters at each time point, they are spatially smooth. So in this case, for example, we can assign an R car model to delta one over uh, uh, until n at the time point t. So we assign an I car model for delta I, uh, y t at each, uh, time point. The most complicated uh, uh, specification is for type four. That is, we assume dependent structure of both space and time. So in this case, there is a, a is assumed to follow a normal distribution with precision matrix sigma uh, delta squared r delta, where r delta is a connected product 
of the structure matrix of the main spatial random effect and the main temporal random effect. So one item uh, I'd like to introduce here is uh, the excess property. So since SI, for example, SI indicates the difference between the relative risk for a particular area and the average risk for the entire standard region. So these, it can be used to identify areas with higher and lower risk. So the first indicator we can use is the posterior mean of SI or the posterior median of SI. But this posterior, either posterior mean or posterior median is a point estimate. So it doesn't account for uh, the uncertainties associated, associated with, uh, uh, with the parameters. So in this case, instead of using the point estimate, we can use the full distribution of parameters. So uh, in this case, the excess property to detect either cost spots or cold spots. So in this case, the chance of, uh, of force hot spot or cold spot detection could be uh, uh, minimized. Uh, in particular, uh, the, posterior, the excess probability is the posterior probability of SI greater or smaller than zero. So uh, for example, for hot spot, we can uh, define it as the posterior probability of SI greater than zero, greater or equal to uh, 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 a value, the, the, the uh, cut of value C. And in contrast, the cold spot could be the posterior distribution of SI smaller than zero, greater or equal to these cutoff value C. And those commonly uh, used values of C uh, include 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.95, and 0.99, and depending on uh, uh, like your, your, uh, your analysis, or for example, like if you want to, you can use a more conservative values, uh, like 0.95 or 0.99, if, uh, like you have like fewer resources to, uh, to be allocated to, to those uh, areas. So here, like this map shows the, uh, the left map shows the posterior mean of the SI and the right map shows the posterior uh, probability that is the excess probability of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, SI. So you can see that they don't exactly match with each other. Okay, I need to hurry up, yeah. So finally, like we can implement the, uh, uh, also specify the price for other unknown parameters. For example, the crash coefficient, the spatial correlation parameter, and the hyperparameters in, in the model. Okay, so, so far I've introduced the principles of Bayesian spatial temporal statistical models, but in practice, statistical modeling of spatial temporal data sets, the way they are measured at small area levels, uh, such as sense tracks, uh, zip codes, they face more challenges beyond spatial autocorrelation, temporal autocorrelation, and space-time interaction. For example, like in this map, those counties uh, with one to four new HIV diagnoses, they are suppressed or censored. Uh, uh, and so they, they are not released to the public. So in this case, we have the data sensory issue. So there are traditional methods to deal with is, is this uh, data uh, sensory issue include data deletion. For example, uh, we delete all those censored or suppressed values from the analysis. We can also use data substitution approaches. For example, we use larger area level values as a proxy for the values that are censored at a small area level. Uh, and we also have the multiple imputation approach that uh, we use suppressed data, uh, we impute the suppressed or censored data multiple times and doing the analysis for each uh, imputed complete data set and then combine the results. But uh, the uh, disadvantage is that for all of these methods, we are unable to propagate the imputation uncertainties into the final statistical inferences. But another promise approach for Bayesian approach is, uh, is, is using a Bayesian approaches to deal with sensor data because the missing data or the sensor data are treated as unknown parameters. And uh, we can, uh, like at each sample, we can, uh, like an uh, estimate is generated for each missing value such that a complete data set is generated. And then we can directly propagate the uncertainties with data imputation in the statistical inference. And those uncertainties uh, could be uh, properly quantified via posterior distributions. 
So here is the model uh, I, uh, we use uh, like in the article in form annals of AG. I'm not going to to uh, the details, uh, but uh, because it's similar to the model that we just uh, discussed. But the difference is that for those counts that are suppressed, we can use a truncated uh, Poisson distribution rather than the regular distribution. So only the values between one and four will be sampled in the process. And we included uh, in this in the Nimble uh, program and we assessed with those uh, indicator uh, best methods we used. Yeah, so, and we also uh, did a simulation study to uh, validate uh, the model so, uh, in different scenarios. So when the true hotspots are in uh, different sizes, uh, uh, in scenario A and in scenario B, most true hotspots are located at the singletons. And we also did the simulation for different types of uh, spatial correlation, including independence, moderate, and strong spatial uh, uh, dependence. And all the results indicate uh, uh, show that the models fa uh, fa fairly uh, fit the model, including fitting the regression coefficients and detecting the true hotspots. And those suppressed values are also imputed well. So usually like uh, the true value or the value next to the true value. And we also found that the sensitivity and the specificity uh, like in, uh, for the model are also uh, uh, have a good result. And these are the uh, empirical study uh, re uh, results for BCP. So again, I'm, I'm, I don't have time to go over that, but uh, you are encouraged to refer to my uh, uh, article in Annals of AG for, uh, uh, for the results. Here we we identify the overall spatial pattern, uh, uh, the left uh, up uh, left upper uh, maps. We identify the overall temporal pattern, the lower uh, bottom um, uh, figure, and we also identify for the like local departures from the overall uh, spatial pattern, uh, spatial temporal pattern of uh, late late HIV diagnosis. So a second example is based in spatial temporal modeling of zero inflated data. So here I use a late HIV diagnosis count at the sense track level in Philadelphia as an example. So because the data analyzed was collected from the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, so to protect privacy and confidentiality, so I'm not supposed to show uh, the raw data, uh, the raw count of late HIV diagnosis per sense track, like even in our uh, manuscript under review. So here I only show the histograms of the count of late HIV diagnosis in each year between 2010 and 2016. So you can see that there is a large percentage of observed values are zero. So that leads to the over dispersion uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the model. So uh, which cannot be addressed by, for example, negative binomial distribution that uses additional parameter to account for this over, disper uh, over dispersion. But if we ignore the zero inflation that could lead to, for example, type two error, uh, uh, the false negative, or inadequately addressing over dispersion. And in the context of spatial temporal data, so ignore, uh, it's difficult to uh, precisely review the online spatial temporal process and detect clusters if we, uh, we have this zero inflation issue. So in this case, we will need to, uh, one of the approaches to address this zero inflation is to use a mixture model. In this case, a zero inflated Poisson model to, uh, with two components. One component is a point mass at zero that uses a balloon distribution to model zeros and a Poisson distribution to model the positive counts. And here we have two sources of zeros. The structure of the zero, we also call that as true zero as a chance zero. Uh, so in this case, we can explicitly model this, uh, uh, this zero inflation issue. Again, I don't have time to go over that. Uh, you can, uh, we can talk later, like if you're interested to learn, learn more about this uh, approach. So finally, I would like to say a few words like about, uh, uh, I, I know like I'm, I have already used up my time, but I would like to say a few words about uh, something I would like to do uh, in the coming years. So that is from based in statistical modeling to based in machine learning. So uh, as I mentioned, one of the, uh, my favorite features of Bayesian analysis is its capacity to quantify estimation uncertainties via those posterior probability distributions rather than a point estimate. So this feature is especially important in fields such as bioinformatics and healthcare. So while machine learning approaches have many advantages, including weak prior assumption, so we don't assume like a, a, a distribution or likelihood for the data. 
uh, as well as uncovering nonlinear relationships and analyzing big data sets in different formats. So it seems natural to leverage the benefits of both Bayesian stats and machine learning by using Bayesian learning approaches. So in fact, this is not an uh, entirely new concept. For example, like there, uh, there is this Bayesian additive regression tree uh, have, uh, that are increasingly popular in health data analysis. And so though, uh, recent developments in for, uh, those computationally tractable sample algorithms and the greater access to CPU or GPU processing power have facilitated a new resurgence of Bayesian machine learning. But I see some challenges in uh, these like Bayesian machine learning or deep learning approaches, including, uh, but a lot limited to prior specification, model uh, implementation, or spatially and or spatial temporal expli explicit uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, but these are some, uh, but these are something I'm interested in investigating more in the coming uh, years. Okay, uh, so that's something uh, what I want to cover today for the webinar. Thanks for your attention. I'm ready to take questions uh, if I still have some time. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wang, for the very informative uh, presentation. I'm very I'm sure that uh, the audience will have uh, questions. Uh, I mean, you need a lot of uh, statistical background to understand uh, those uh, uh, concepts and some of the uh, equations. And so now mm -hmm. we're gonna open the, the floor for uh, questions. And so we go through the uh, the chat first and then um, the yeah, audience I see can unmute yourself if you have questions to ask. Yes, I, I like this. Uh, I'm uh, assuming that you are, uh, Jerry, I'm assume, assuming that you're, uh, you're referring to the book, uh, like statistics for uh, spatial temporal data using R. So mm -hmm. if you are referring to that book, uh, actually, uh, honestly, I like that book because it has a lot of, uh, covers both methods from the, uh, if, uh, that uh, if frequentist, uh, using frequency statistics uh, and basic statistics. And it also have a lot of examples uh, using our, uh, uh, our code in the book. So uh, this, uh, I, I, see, uh, I would say I like this book. And uh, I also, I do have recommendations for academic reading. Um, actually, I, I don't have a slide here. But one I would like to uh, encourage you to, to access is uh, geospatial health data analysis using INDA from Paula, uh, who is a professor, uh, 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 in spatial stats, and this book is uh, openly accessible, so you can access it online. Uh, another book I would recommend if you are using R, so that would be the spatial and spatial temporal uh, uh, basis disease mapping using R from Dr. Andrew Lawson. So he also have a book on uh, using spatial disease mapping, uh, not necessarily on R, but also using other specialized software such as Winbugs, Limbo, uh, uh, etc. So does that uh, answer your question, Jerry? Yes, thank you for the recommendation. Yeah. And uh, let's go to the next one. So if you have any questions, uh, you can continue to type into the chat or um, you can uh, unmute yourself. So the second one from uh, Hunt. Uh, thank you for you the sharing. Do you need to consider the causal diagram underlying mm -hmm. different spatial temporal. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question because one of the uh, uh, like cutting edge like questions that is explored in business stats is spatial uh, and, also, and spatial temporal causal inference. So I would say that depends, to answer your question, that depends on your research question. Are you going to, uh, do you want to analyze an association or do you want to derive a causal relationship between the Y and X? So, but I would say that uh, deriving a causal uh, relationship would be much, much more challenging uh, because uh, for example, like uh, uh, you, that requires like, like more uh, uh, demands on the data itself. For example, if you can match, uh, if, if we are using the match approach, do you have like data similar a, a similar characteristics to support these like causal inference. So like, again, I think that that depends. Yeah, again, it depends on your risk questions. So from my perspective, probably not if you are doing uh, like association analysis and if your data does not support 
a special uh, calling for us uh, you, before you build your uh, basic models. Okay, next one from uh, Dr. Yi. Are you envisioning in your work that uh, the Bayesian machine learning to be spatial, temporal, inseparable? I would say so, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because as I mentioned, like, it is more realistic to see some local departures from the uh, separate model, because we cannot assume that the overall temporal and spatial patterns applies to all the entire area for all time periods. So usually we would uh, like expect uh, like a uh, uh, spatial temporal inseparability. Uh, but to be honest, to implement this spatial temporal inseparability that uh, has more depend on the implementation side. So how do we uh, like efficiently derive these like departures like a local departures from the overall spatial and temporal trend, that would be like a, a issue. Because as you see, like uh, in even in the basic statistical model, like we have to uh, estimate much more, uh, a, much, a much larger number of uh, unknown parameters compared with the number of data observations. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I, do, I do have a, I do okay. have a question. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Wang. Right. Hello. Hello, Dr. Wang. Nice, nice to yeah. see you online. And thanks yeah. for your presentation. Very informative. Um, I have a question regarding the setting of the prior distribution. Mm -hmm. You know, I had I had experience working with Bayesian change point detection. And my experience is that for some Bayesian models, the, you know, the posterior distribution can be very sensitive to uh, the prior distribution. So if I use uninformative priors, you know, the sampling approach, for, um, for example, the MCMC you just mentioned, will fail to converge. But in certain geographical cases, we do not have any knowledge of the parameters we try to estimate, right? So we have no mm -hmm. choice but to use uninformative priors. So my question for you is, you know, do you have any suggestion on what we need to do if the model fails to converge using uninformative priors? in geographical cases. I yeah, I think the uh, yes, I totally agree with you that uh, the posterior uh, inferences could be very sensitive to prior specifications. Uh, so that's again, so that's one of the major critic uh, from the frequent uh, test uh, uh, scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, so and I also agree that in most cases it's hard to use uh, informative priors to for those unknown parameters. So my suggestion uh, the one solutions I use is I would check, for example, the model specification. So if the model is a good, could uh, fit your data well. So because in addition to prior, we also need to consider the like data model in the first level of the hierarchical specification. So that would be one thing I uh, uh, would consider. The other is that uh, for the non-informative priors, they also have different uh, like formats, as you can see. For example, like we can specify the priors to the sensitive deviation, or we can specify the prior to the various parameter. So these could also cause some like uh, improve the convergence uh, or uh, 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 or like de de uh, decrease the convergence, slow the convergence. So uh, and also uh, if you are using MCMC. Uh, like setting the initial values is also of great importance. So if you set the uh, initial values not that proper properly, so in that case, that also slow or even makes the chance uh, not convert converging. So these could be the the solutions like I would suggest to try if you have the convergence problem. And also like you could you can, you can also try for example using the posterior approximation approach rather than the posterior sampling approach like MCMC. Yeah, but of course, like as I mentioned, using MCMC is more flexible in fitting like uh, those non-traditional or like the non-conjugate uh, priors. Does right. that answer your question, Dr. Sure, Wang? Sure. Thank you very yeah. much, very, very helpful. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Thank Gao. You. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for your wonderful presentation. Yeah, I learned a lot. So um, because you have done a lot of empirical work uh, using this uh, the Bayesian modeling framework. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think uh, 
uh, it's very challenging. It's about, as you mentioned, is about those assumptions. For example, in tem in time series modeling, even for those temporal autographic model, we also have we can assume like uh, the you know the mean train and then with uh, uh, the random noise or certain distribution noise, mm -hmm. or the noise could be like changing like the magnitude can be you know changing over time. <laughs> Similarly, as you mentioned, you also in the spatial there are autographic setting, you also assume or do some assumption about different degree of the spatial dependence, mm -hmm. and which is often true for the uh, spatial temporal data. So when you consider the space, the spatial and temporal interactions, I feel it's more complicated. So maybe could you give us some maybe general tips or insights about, you know, when we do those assumption, you know, whether we should choose like maybe assume the uh the constant or you know mm -hmm. or the noise you know they yeah it's just random noise or like you said ratio random time or on them or uh <laughs> yeah. it's you know i don't have any you know <laughs> yeah that's a great question uh, dr gao yeah i uh completely agree with you that like doing space to temporal statistics uh, either using frequentist or busy approaches they are uh probably could be intimating uh at the beginning uh, uh because we don't know that there are just so many uncertainties that we can about the model specification. So what kind of data, data uh, likelihood we should choose, what kind of priors we should choose, you know. Um, so, uh, but my suggestion would be, my answer correctly to you is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So you can start, we can start with like a model that could make sense to your data set. For example, like I would use the, like late HIV diagnosis uh, data set as an example, because uh, before to specify or build the like statistical model, we can do some descriptive statistic analysis. Uh, we can see if based on, let's say the total number of late HIV diagnosis, we see that the, there could be a sharp decreasing trend. So in this case, like we probably, uh, probably choosing a linear trend would be appropriate rather than using those like more complicated, like for, for example, those like splice to account for the fluctuations of uh, like late HIV di diagnosis trend. So like linear trend could be like uh, uh, reasonable in for that data set. So, uh, so first is based on the data set. The second could be, we can try to fit different models with reasonable assumptions because like we cannot say that this model is the only option. There are always like like uh, unlimited beyond unlimited options or unlimited uh, like combinations. For example, for the spatial, temporal, space time interaction. So in, the, in this case, like we can compare like fit a limited number of candidate models to see which one fit the data set better. So that would be my second solution to, uh, to like for model uh, 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 selection. Uh, probably that my major like two major solutions to to to, to yeah. To, yeah. Thank you. The questions. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the tips. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have yeah, one, one last question, question on the chat uh, from uh, Adamu. Can this model be used in uh, comparative yeah. spatial temporal studies between different reasons? Uh, where some drivers factors may not be available in one of the regions. I would say. But not because uh, when the first the model can be applied to the two different data sets in those two diff uh, those different regions, uh, no problem with that. But probably that doesn't support the direct comparison between the models because the data used to fit the models are different. We can only like sh uh, compare the models uh, that. Uh, uh, Okay, let me see about that. Usually we compare different models that are fitted to the same data set uh, and see which one fits the data better. Uh, no, yeah, I would say no, because two different regions, two different data sets. You can use the same model to uh, some drivers may not be available. Okay, yeah, so short answer, no. I don't think that's uh, directly comparable. Okay, but one thank solution, you all for, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the one solution, potential solution, mm -hmm. is that if that uh drivers or factors is not available, you can do a joint uh spatial uh, uh, uh Bayesian modeling. For example, like to estimate uh the the mixing drivers or factors. And uh, again, so if you are using Bayesian approach, those uncertainties associated with those uh, the estimation could be directly propagated in uh I mean the uncertainties. Could be directly propagated in your uh, final statistical inference. So that would be my uh, my answer to to your question. Okay, thank you all for the questions. Um, we're kind of out of the time, but uh, I will ask maybe one last questions. So mm -hmm. I was wondering um, because especially with the last couple of years with all the AI, deep learning, and and machine learning like uh, the advancement. So in terms of the spatial temporal modeling. Have you like compare some of the uh, Bayesian statistical modeling methods with some of the deep learning one uh, recurrent neural network? Because uh, more and more those methods are being used to do, for example, mm -hmm. forecasting, weather forecasting, something like that. So do you see potentially the deep learning can help you improve some of the statistical modeling or do you see like they are competing with each other or what's your thoughts on some of this? latest mm -hmm. advancements on AI and uh, deep learning? Yeah, this is a, a great question. Uh, yes, I would say I would say they are competing with each other, but they, rather they are complementary to each other. Mm -hmm. Because as I mentioned on the last slide of my uh, presentation, uh, they have, both of them, of them have the, uh, their own unique advantages. For example, like for machine learning or deep learning, we don't have those restrictive like assumptions about data likelihood. Uh, but for Bayesian approaches, we can uh, like, like quantify the uncertainties associated with those uh, estimation. So uh, first, so far I haven't done uh, uh, any comparison uh, because to me, uh, because to, to be honest, like the, some machine learning or deep learning approaches are like a black box to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm more comfortable with like uh, to directly model those spatial patterns, spatial temporal patterns, and then map and like to use uh, like a uh, statistical inference. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that to, uh, that question is no, but would that be interesting to compare like the Bayesian statistics and uh, the machine learning or deep learning approaches? Uh, that's something actually I, I want to to. Uh, mm -hmm. to do uh, in the coming year, uh, for example, using graph neural network, you know, so that could be something I can compare and see the, uh, uh, its effectiveness in uh, uh, imputing those sensor to data values. So this particularly could be very uh, useful in those uh, sensor to health data analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, for, I think I answered like two parts. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, because some of the, mm -hmm. the methods right now, I mean, it used to be like uh, totally black box, but now more and more actually methods or mm -hmm. people try to integrate some physics, for example, physics aware deep learning model, something like that, trying to incorporate those into uh, spatial temporal model. If it's very for, great of forecasting, so they look like especially last language model and some of those deep learning models that might potentially help solve Mm -hmm. Some problem, but certainly they are complementary. I think it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I, thought, I, some... I can't agree more. Yeah. yeah, actually, I'm looking forward to to research on this topic and see how the how we can leverage or capitalize on the benefits from both approaches. Yeah. Okay, so I, I we are kind of out of time. So thank you very much all for attending. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you feel free to reach out to uh, uh Dr. Wan and. Uh, Let's thank Dr. Wan once again uh, for the yeah, very uh, informative uh, yeah. presentation. And also, I, I would be willing to uh, to, mm -hmm. to would be like to to say, uh, share the uh, uh, PowerPoint slides mm -hmm. uh, to answer uh, the uh, uh, question. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, we also share the video. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can also watch the video. We maybe we also put the slides under okay. the link of the video uh, when we share the video. Uh, maybe sometime tomorrow. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Wan, again, and we see you uh, next week, uh, same time, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.